Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining SAMHSA's program to achieve wellness for today's webinar, Making the Shift from Patient Activation to Community Activation. I'm Crystal Brando, the Assistant Director of SAMHSA's Program to Achieve Wellness, and we're very excited to bring you this conversation today. We have a great panel of speakers that will talk about these topics of patient activation, community activation, and what it all means for individuals with serious mental illness. It's important to note that the views expressed in this training do not necessarily represent the views, policies, and positions of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. What, you're, what you'll hear our speakers talk about today um, are, like I've mentioned, patient activation and community activation, but also you'll get an understanding of the connection between community health and wellness for individuals with serious mental illness, and we hope that by the end of today's presentation, you'll be able to describe the components of an activated community and thus be able to apply strategies for patient and community activation in your own local communities in order to improve outcomes for individuals with serious mental illness. So to accomplish all of that today, we have an excellent panel of speakers that will be connecting with you all. And um, I'll go into depth on introduction of two, our, two of our first speakers who will then introduce the others. So first you'll hear from Sue Burgesson. Sue is a person with lived experience and the principal at Recovery, Resiliency, Engagement, and Activation Partners and the peer lead for Seven Cups, an online peer support and recovery tech firm, as well as a consultant with Open Minds. She's a frequent speaker and author and has authored many articles and contributed to many books, including the Physician's Definitive Guide to Mood Disorders. For many years, she served as the CEO of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance and then as the National Vice President of Consumer Affairs, excuse me, Consumer and Family Affairs at Optum, a Fortune 6 company. She's a member of the Program to Achieve Wellness Steering Committee, and we're delighted to have her here with us today. She'll be one of the first speakers that you'll hear from. After Sue, you'll hear from Chaku Matai, who has over 30 years of experience with mental health and addiction, community-based services, and a wide variety of roles, including as youth leader, peer advocate, peer support leading facilitator, self-help educator, community organizer, community residence manager, psychiatric rehabilitation practitioner, and the list goes on. He is the president and CEO of the Mental Health Association in Rochester, New York. Previously, he served as the NAMI Director of Systems Transformation and the director of the NAMI Star Center, providing TA to facilitate the structuring of mental health systems by promoting recovery and consumer-directed approaches. He's also a member of the Program to Achieve Wellness Steering Committee. You'll get uh, further introductions to our other two speakers a little, a little bit later. Uh, we're delighted to have Margaret Walkover, who's the chair of the Population Health Work Group for the APHA Mental Health Section with us, as well as Wendy Ellis, the project director at the Milken Institute of, excuse me, Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. So now that I've spent quite some time here on introductions, I'm going to hand it over to Sue to kick off this discussion on patient activation. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with everyone today. Uh, activation is one of the things that I am just so interested in and have really woven into pretty much everything I have been doing. Um, during the session that I'm going to be leading, you know, it, it seemed logical that before we talk about activation within community systems, we do a little bit of work around, you know, what is activation within behavioral health in general? So that's really what I'm charged with um, this afternoon, depending, of course, where you are in the, in the country. It may be morning for you. Um, but I'm going to talk about the concepts of activation within behavioral health. I'm going to look at that based on a couple of different theories so that you can kind of think about this within the frame of, um, stage of change theory and self-determination theory, and then I'm going to do a little bit of work in saying, okay, what might that look like in behavioral health practice? And we're going to do that in order to set, set the stage for the work that the rest of the team is going to be doing here around um, activation from a community perspective. So when I think about activation, you know, usually when I'm out there talking with folks, um, there, we tend to use the word engagement and activation as if they are the same thing, and I get that. But I, I want to make the case that they're really a little bit different. They're probably on the same continuum. 
But I think that engagement is when you actually go and say, interact with your doc. You actually show up for an appointment. You're engaged. You're engaged with the healthcare system at that at one point. You're activated when you're actually taking action um, on your own health and you know, working together with your, your clinical team to move your health forward in whatever realm that is, whether it's behavioral health or or physical health or the intersection of both. So I think this is pretty logical. All of us can, can talk about a time when we were engaged, but not, not activated. So you might have gone to see one of your docs and your docs may have said to you, you know, you could stand to lose like 20 pounds. Or maybe your doc has said to you, you know, better stop smoking. Or, you know, everything looks good, but are you exercising at least X amount of times per week? Or something that might improve your health. And you, you leave the office with the best of intentions, but life is complicated and you find yourself not acting on those recommendations that your clinician had while you were visiting with them. So you were engaged with the system, but you were not activated. You are not taking action based on that system's recommendation. And that, of course, is part of the secret sauce here in terms of helping people who are living with a serious mental illness. How do we bridge that gap between engagement and activation? And, and Judith Hibbert is kind of the leading um, thinker in this area, and she's suggested that there are six core elements of activation. They're pretty logical, and as you can see them here, the first one is symptom self-management. And as a consumer and as a, as a consumer who works with other consumers and works with providers on person-centered care, we talk a lot about self-management. What are the techniques that work for you? Do you find taking a walk helpful when you're feeling anxious? When you're depressed, do you find it helpful to connect with people in a support group? What about meditation? What about um, you know, using wellness recovery action plan or rep plans? You know, there are lots of techniques here that people should be using when they're feeling their symptoms pop up. Well, then, you know, Hibbert is saying, let's go a little deeper and let's think about actions that support health, not just manage symptoms when they pop up. So in behavioral health, that might be uh, something as simple as, hmm, let's pay attention to how much sleep you're getting every night. Or, because of course, uh, sleep can really impact your symptoms. Or you know, are you um, managing your, your diabetes so that your sugar spikes are not impacting your health in a way that makes you, you know, jump up your symptoms or feel like you, you're having more anxiety or irritation? Or, you know, what are those, those things you can be doing that, that really are a prevention focus that keep you healthy? Um, and then the third thing she talks about really it links very closely with this fourth thing. You can see them up there. You know, a consumer needs to be involved in their treatment decision making and, and they want to be collaborating with healthcare professionals. And of course, you know, as you think about that, as a consumer, I know some stuff. As providers, they know some stuff that's really important, but together, we know a lot more. Um, providers need to know when a consumer is experiencing symptoms or what kind of things will work for them or not work for them. Uh, and consumers need to understand, you know, what their options are and be engaged in that so that they can, can help choose the right thing for them at any given time. For example, one time I uh, received a medication and I didn't have the best alliance with my clinician at that point. And it turns out that this medication had, um, was known for having a side effect of being really drowsy. Unfortunately, I drove two hours to Chicago in rush hour traffic every morning, so that wasn't a good choice for me. So I had to kind of go back in and say, all right, this is what's going on, and we have to work together on another medication with a different side effect profile. Of course, one would like no side effect of profile, but you know, that, that really worked a little bit better for me in that situation. So I, I need to, needed to align, I need to be, to be involved, I needed to give information to the provider that would help them make good choices, and the provider needed to know this information about me as well. So the fifth um, core element you can see here is choosing a good provider. And that good is not meant to be some are good, some are bad. That may be, but really, as a consumer, you need to kind of be thoughtful about that. It may be that you're going to respond better to someone with your same 
um, ethnic background or a specific gender, or you might find it more helpful to have a prescriber who is near your, where you work or near where, you ho your ho where your home is. So being involved and even saying, oh, I have some choices here and I'm gonna make choices that work a little bit better for me is part of activation. And then the sixth core element she talks about here is navigating the system. And that can be as simple as um, figuring out how to get an appointment, how to get to the place for an appointment, or as complicated as understanding what your insurance might cover or how you, you know, um, how you manage a denial of a claim and, you know, get a service that you need. Now, Judith also says, you know, there are some things that are so fundamental, she doesn't even want to put them in core elements, they just have to get done. And so you have to think about them even before you look at these elements. And they include um, a patient's belief. And I kind of, and when I think about that, I think about that in terms of, of a cultural approach. So I may respond um, in a certain way because of my cultural background. And if you haven't done work in this area, I really strongly encourage you to uh, look at the cultural activation prompts from Nathan uh, Klein, I think it is. Um, and Shaku, perhaps you can jot a note there and say, and let folks know if I got that right or not. But um, you could just Google um, and find this wonderful program. And let me tell you how that help was helpful for me. So I happen to be of Scandinavian descent. And when I went through the cultural activation prompts, I realized that my heritage um, was teaching me that I should not complain a lot and that. Um, uh, a couple other things that were uh, were involved that really meant that I was not communicating particularly well with my clinical team. So once I was aware of some of the influences that my background had on the way I was interacting with my healthcare team, I, I was able to just be more upfront and to, to be better at communicating. So paying attention to culture is really critical, even with my silly example about the Scandinavian heritage. I also um, would point out, she says, you have to have some knowledge. And I usually give an example here of a colleague that I worked with who was assigned the task of going around a particular state and talking to consumers and finding out certain things. That state had a really great reputation for being recovery oriented, but as he went around the state, he realized that almost none of the consumers knew what their diagnosis was. No one knew. Um, what their medication was, no one knew what their medication was supposed to do, and no one knew what they should feel like if they were starting to feel better. So having that basic knowledge is pretty important for us as consumers in moving into wellness. And then, of course, some skills. I think of those uh, mostly in symptom self-management skills, but you gotta have some skills and you have to secure emotional support. And of course, we all know how important that is to care and to treatment as a whole. Um, so those are the kind of the core elements and the fundamental issues that are critical here. Now, it is not a zero sum game. That means, you know, if you're activated, you're not just activated in everything. You can be activated in one thing and not in another. And that's what this little cartoon shows. You can read that to yourself, but of course this gentleman is saying, um, you know, this tuna salad sandwich has been out. I don't know if it's safe. I don't think I'm gonna eat it. And then in the last frame he says, well, now excuse me while I go outside and smoke another cigarette. So he's clearly activated in some health-related things and not activated in other health-related things. And that's kind of how life is, right? So as you think about activation, you have to look at that discreetly with people and realize they may be one place with certain things and another place with, a, with completely different health behaviors. Now, as you think about um, this, you might be wondering, now how is activation different from stage of change? And we all love stage of change theory um, from Prochaska and DiClementa, um, and is this critical to behavioral health? And we, uh, I certainly honor this and use this quite a bit. So um, activation is slightly different. So there are things you have to do in stage of change. Predictable stages you're gonna go through to be ready to make a change. Well, when you're ready, you still can't completely jump in. And that really is what the patient activation measure is helping us understand. 
patient activation is Judith Hibbard's work that was translated into um, a questionnaire that is now um, uh, managed by Anna Insignia Health. And I encourage you to take a look at that. And you can see, it said, you know, if you're in level one, even if you're ready for change, you're gonna be a little disengaged. You really don't understand your role here and you're gonna be overwhelmed. You don't have enough knowledge, you don't have much confidence. And then when you were, uh, move into level two, you've got some awareness, you've got some education, you don't have a lot of confidence. And then you move into level three when you're ready to just jump out and you've got all the skills, you've got some successes behind you and you can run. When I was in a, a meeting with, um, with this clinician who, who wrote this, um, Judy said that most programs in behavioral health and in health itself really start with level three. They assume, oh, you're ready for change. Okay, now we're gonna throw you into this program that is you know, maybe a little complicated and most programs fail because they haven't taken into consideration these kind of levels of activation. And so as we move forward and think about activation within the frame of community, I think Shaku is gonna have some more to say about that. But it's super helpful as you think about this, even in kind of the clinical setting. And there's one more that we're gonna take a look at as I move this forward, and that is, you know, how does this work within self-determination? Well, I think of stage of change, level of activation, and um, self-determination, all those kind of facets of the gem that is um, behavior change. And you can see that um, this from the Center of Self-Determination is a really great look at, you know, how people kind of consider motivation. Some people are completely not motivated, but then when you start moving into motivation, some folks are motivated by external issues. And we all know folks who have, you know, been motivated this way, perhaps um, they've gone into a drug court and they said, you gotta change or this is the consequence. Um, and that's a pretty good, pretty good way for some people to be motivated. I have seen a lot of people use this kind of fear-based motivation in ways that are not super helpful, like if you don't take your meds, you're gonna end up in the hospital. That's, that's really hard, it's a little hard to figure that out as a consumer, because of course all of us believe that we're invincible. So care needs to be taken around external regulation, but you know, what they're saying here is um, you can move into interjection where you know, you're motivated because people are praising you for an action, and then you move into identification when you really say, you know, this will help me reach my own goals. This is important to me, I value this. It'll help me reach my goals. And then you can synthesize all of that into the integrated stance. And eventually for some people that becomes an intrinsic motivation. I think about this in terms of folks who love to exercise. Um, you know, they, they, they have a little endorphin rush and they just enjoy that activity. Um, so you can get there as well. And you, I think it's pretty easy to see how all of this aligns. All right, I'm just gonna rush through um, my next few slides because of course we wanna get to the good stuff here. Um, but again, to reinforce the basic concept of activation, how might we do this in a behavioral health clinical setting? So if you're a clinician or if you're a peer supporter, if you look at the element, the first element that Hibbert has identified, symptom self-management, you might ask the question, what self-care tools are you using? You might explain what that is and you might give a few examples of that and make sure they're in their hands. And at another session, you might focus on uh, the second element. Um, you might help people think about actions they could be taking to support their health, talking about sleep, asking them what things they could do that can support their overall health and how else from a health perspective we can help you meet your recovery goals. Um, I realize you're not gonna do all of these things at one time, so I'm just trying to show you how you could add one or two questions each time. As I'm trying to advance the slide, and it just doesn't wanna go. All right. In uh, the third level that we're talking about here, involvement in treatment decision-making, if you're a clinician or if you're a peer supporter, you might say what information or questions might help you be in, more involved in our treatment plan. If you're a peer, you might say, you know, your meetings with your clinical team. 
might give them some examples. Uh, it might be considered what options you, we could consider more options. We could talk about more about your, your worries um, about the treatment. And then in four, you might, uh, in another visit, you might say, you know, you're the expert about you. We really value that and want to hear about that. What's working? We want to know what you want and what's not working. In this stage, I love it when clinicians talk about what is it you want to achieve? And not just feeling better, but what is it you want your life to achieve? And how is this helping you? The more we connect those dots, in our collaborative process, the more engaged the consumer can be or activated they can be in their own care because it makes more sense to their life and hits more of those um, intrinsic goals that they have. We also, as we move on to four, it's just done now. There we go. Um, we also might ask the question, what two, one or two things can we do here? Can, can we improve or can your provider improve? And I would just make a little note here and say, I've talked to lots of consumers in lots of different settings over the many years I've been involved with this. And I continue to hear that the clinician often is, is office is often the most stigmatizing place people go. And you can ask, have a survey question with four or five questions on it, but you're going to get more information if you actually ask the question and are really interested in learning the answer. Because, you know, there are things you can probably do to create a more warm and welcoming environment, and there are things that your staff could probably be doing to be a little bit more warm and welcoming. Um, people are walking in with their own internal stigma, of course, but, you know, People are busy, there's a lot, you know, off, oftentimes um, staff ha are experiencing some burnout. Sometimes our uh, places where we work are not as inviting. So you could learn a little bit by actually asking this question. And then six, you know, you could ask the question, um, what one or two places are you getting stuck? This is a complicated system, how can we help? You can ask that as a peer, you can ask that as a, as a uh, clinician. And then, I've also created a little kind of outline here about the fundamental things of each element. You can ask about their support, a lot of strategies you can be doing. You can talk about cultural activation prompts or, or talk about their own culture and how it might be impacting things. You can provide them some information. I kind of laugh because when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I, I came home and I weighed the information I got. I got 27 pounds of written information. That might have been a little much. But when I was diagnosed with a mental health issue, I got no information, nothing written at all. So I think there's probably a balance there, and you could take a look at that. Um, so those are ways we might make this a little bit more uh, focused within our practices. A lot of times I hear from people, you know, so I want to do more around activation, but I don't know about any self-care tools. I'm not going to talk about this. You can download this um, presentation at the end and kind of check out these links for a lot of really great self-care and activation tools in mental health and also in addiction recovery. So I am pleased to have spent some time with you to kind of overview um, activation in the behavioral health um, space. I'm even more thrilled to share uh, the screen now with Shaku Matai, who is someone that I personally think is amazing and one of my personal heroes in the business. So Shaku, take it from here. Thank you. You talk about community activation has meant a great deal to me because I, I've been very excited about it for a, a while as well and I've dug, dug into the research and anyone who is talking about it and especially you when you started talking about it I really needed to better understand how we could apply it and so this opportunity to talk here today to talk about patient activation and community activation and then you know the work that Wendy and Margaret are going to be able to explain and talk about is pretty exciting as well so I'm hoping that what I'll be talking about today in the brief time that I have is really setting up the conversation around the real examples of community activation from a population health perspective and 
from a community perspective. And so the re relationship between some of the principles that Sue just talked about in patient activation, I, just, I, just, I see some real awesome bridge, bridges in the principles and some ways to talk about them uh, together. So that's, that's what I'm going to try to do. So personally, I'm also motivated in this conversation because of my own lived experience as a person with mental health and substance use history and uh, family that's really struggled with how to, how to address these issues, not just as individuals, but as communities. And so uh, I'll talk a lot about that. And I know, Sue, you mentioned some of the cultural aspects of this. And by the way, that was the cultural activation prompts that came out of the Nathan Klein Institute, which is one of the Centers for Excellence and Cultural Competence here in New York State. So if you are interested in that, you can check that out. So thanks for mentioning that, Sue. And I think personally, as an Indian American born in Kuwait, um, very specifically from a state called Kerala, which is southwestern uh, uh, India, and it's the most south, southern state of India, one of the things that I, I like to talk about when it comes to patient activation and the relationship to community activation is that the, those of us who are considered Malayalis or people who are from Kerala are actually have the highest prevalence of diabetes in the world. So one of the issues that, you know, and I wanted to talk about this from the perspective of belief regarding the patient activation measures and drug relationship between the community activation as well, the belief about our ability to actually prevent diabetes is actually very low. In other words, so I have family members, even an uncle of mine who um, recently told me, when, and we were in line in a food, food line in a family's house taking some food. He watched me take very limited, yeah, he, he, he noticed that I wasn't taking as many items as he was. His plate was piled up high and mine was more selective. And he turned to me and scolded me actually in front of everybody else and said, what are you doing? You're not taking any of the, you know, any of the food that people cooked for us. And, uh, and I said, look, I'm one of the last men over 40 in our family that doesn't have diabetes. I'd like to keep it that way. And a few of our family members laughed and, and he said something that blew my mind. He said, you know what, Chaku, you're going to get it anyway, so you might as well eat. So even he, who actually has a medical background, uh, believed that no one in our family, no one, everyone is going to get it, is what he was basically saying. And part of what I needed to take a deep breath about in that, in that moment was that he has never seen anyone. He's had, even in his practice and in his life at home, no one has prevented it. So he had a personal learned helplessness around our actual role in our own health. There was no role for us. It was a completely passive experience from his perspective. So for me, this patient activation measure, this first measure of a belief in my role in my own health care really has to do with whether or not I believe I can make a difference in my health. And that is a major first step for me. And that's why I'm going to talk about the others a little bit as well, but I'm going to stop there for now and kind of move to the next part of this conversation, which is what does that mean for community activation? So for me, the, first of all, the research community activation is very deep, and of course Margaret and, and Wendy are the uh, you know, experts in that area. They'll talk more about it in terms of how they're applying it. But even back to the 90s, some of the real ideas around public health and community activation around health issues it was about increasing community awareness. It was about getting organizations to be more collaborative and plan together. It was about recognizing the role of social determinants of health and the disparities that are occurring in the physical environments of a community. Even in 1990, there was a report called the Heckler Report that recognized those disparities. So when we started to really jump into these issues of community activation around how do we address it and get out of our silos, those were the kinds of things that needed to happen. And then on top of that, there needed to be a sharing and an allocation of resources and a connection and another level of collaboration that changed the real nature of our relationships as community to providers to systems. At the end of the day, it all required some kind of fundamental citizen involvement that people weren't able to necessarily reach without a couple things happening. So what were that? Well, one of those things was the role of those of us who might be impacted by those very health conditions or social problems or issues. So there's the principle of nothing about us without us came right out of that. So whether it was the independent living movement who really you know, coined that phrase at the very beginning and our, our mental health movement and consumer survivor ex-patient movement that 
picked up on it and movements from there on, the addiction recovery movement as well, recognizing that the role of lived experience was core to really having that um, capacity to do something that I'm actually going to talk about here more related to the pedagogy of the oppressed. So Paulo Freire is a Brazilian author that wrote this um, legacy book, this uh, epic uh, book. Check it out sometime. I'm just going to talk about this one principle that he raised in that book, which was about raising consciousness and what what is it involved in the process of raising consciousness, specifically around the primary task of not just the liberation of the oppressed, but also of the oppressor in that context. And so that means community being engaged at another level. What that also means, and really the overall point here, is that if we're not engaging community, the lived experience of the issues we're dealing with in the analysis, as opposed to coming in with a presumed understanding or presumed understanding of what the solutions are, then we're going to just be raising, we're just going to be saying let's educate everybody and not necessarily getting a real sense of what's happening. So that's, that's what we mean by the, actually the difference between raising consciousness versus increasing awareness. So let me say a little bit more about that. This concept of raising consciousness for me as a person with lived experience had something to do with me b believing more that that maybe that maybe I could not just about diabetes but also let's say you know about whether I can work so one of the campaigns that we were really emphasizing back in New York and, and when I was with Niapers we created a week and work campaign and the reason we needed to create the week and work campaign was because we recognized that out of a you know nationally and in statewide we had an 85 to 95 percent unemployment rate for any of us with psychiatric histories and diagnoses and disabilities. And that kind of an unemployment rate could only mean, even if people were being encouraged to, to go to work or even being getting referred to employment supports and services, it wasn't just a lack of supports and services. There was a lack of consciousness around the importance of employment. We might have been told that uh, employment wasn't as important. Even my family was told, don't be as worried about him going back to school or getting a job. He would just be happy he's not trying to kill himself or anyone else. You know, that, that was the message when, when I was in a day program in 1985. Instead, they pushed back on that. They were saying, no, we really want to believe in his ability. We need him to believe in his ability and try to figure that out. But that was considered false hope. That was considered a, uh, a message that might set me up for failure. failure. Instead, we needed to tell people, wait a second, maybe we should talk about that together. So instead of just educating people about that, let's say, for example, unemployment is not necessarily bad for you, it's actually good for you, and maybe unemployment is actually worse for us because poverty um, and unemployment uh, causes more problem, mental health, health, physical health, isolation, substance use, addiction issues, than, any, you know, than even going back to work. Uh, maybe that's something we should look at. Maybe we need to raise awareness about benefits advisement and the kinds of benefits that, and incentives that actually would allow us to return to work. Oh, and maybe there's some policy changes that need to happen in order to make work possible. So that's why we, for example, had to chain ourselves to the governor's office to pass the Medicaid buy-in for working people with disabilities and stop having people have to choose between work and Medicaid. So that kind of consciousness raising required those of us who are impacted by the problem to really sit down and talk about what is it that we're really struggling with? What don't we believe about ourselves? What, what do we need? It's not just a policy change that's going to make the difference. We needed to get out and say we can work. We needed to be able to say it to ourselves and take the risks that were involved in that. And all the things that Sue talked about in terms of activation, which is kind of getting the knowledge and confidence from there and moving forward with taking the action and, and even when under stress, trying to figure out how to make that real. And that happens for organizations as well, and, and also, you know, communities, of course. So I wanted to bring, bring up this uh, important picture of Dr. Bill Anthony, Dr. Uh, Marion Farkas, and Dr. Courtney Harding, were, were, who were people that in an environment, you know, in the late 80s, their research prior to that showed them that recovery was certainly not only possible, it could be expected, especially for a group of people that the research had been shown and the literature had been showing up to that point, that we were only going to be in the backwards of state hospitals. Basically, the idea was that a third of us would get better, a third of us would get a little better, and then a third would always be uh, restricted to uh, hospital environments. Well, 
Courtney Harding, for example, researched that last third, along with other researchers around the country and around the world, and found in longitudinal studies that not only do we get better, we get off of medications, go back to work, relate well to family and friends, connect well to, to our community. You can never tell that we were ever hospitalized before. And these kinds of ideas, again, were seen as so radical or life-changing. You know, they, they, they were, people were pushing back quite a bit. In fact, you know, the literature wasn't even being, the recognized literature about this and research wasn't being acknowledged because it was such a paradox in, in the literature. I bring that up because the real difference around this recovery movement was about the community. The community got activated not because of their research. We leveraged their research but our community got activated because we said, you know what, we are the evidence. We are looking around at ourselves. We discovered that we were, we were better than we thought we were. We were better than the community thought we were, and we needed to start talking about that. So I hope that doesn't sound too preachy and too, you know, theoretical and philosophical, but I do want to emphasize that what we're trying to do here is get to that first measure where we've shifted from not only a, a person changing our belief and our ability to impact our health. But as a community, there are many times our own communities, our own neighborhoods have been literally marginalized and oppressed to a point where we don't see it, we can't see necessarily what, what the options are. And we might be trying to get better and then return to the same conditions, when I know, which I know, for example, Wendy's going to talk about no longer doing when it comes to adverse childhood experiences, really looking at how do we change the conditions in community in order to make that real. And Margaret's going to talk about how to really bring a public perspective in, into, into focus around what's, what's important to us. So I want to make sure there's room for that and time for that. So I'm going to cut mine a little bit short now. I had a few more minutes reserved for, for some more discussion, but I'm really hoping that between Margaret and Wendy we'll be able to uh, cover it. So, Sue, let me give it back to you. I hope that was okay, uh, so you can introduce um, our next speaker. Wonderful. I am thrilled. If you could uh, throw the ball over to um, Margaret, I would really appreciate that. So, we just have a, super, a great treat, and I am thrilled to introduce Margaret. Um, Working with consumer survivors and family members, Margaret Walkover has managed regional and statewide initiatives within California's community behavioral health system for over 20 years. She's also taken on several national roles within the American Public Health Association's mental health section and is now chair of the section's population health work group. Margaret is currently a PhD student and researcher at the University of Hawaii's office of Public Health Studies. I am thrilled to introduce her and excited about what she's going to share with us. Thanks, Margaret. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm so happy that Chaku ended his talk with that picture of Bill Anthony, Courtney Harding, and Lynn Farkas. Um, the reason why is because activation starts with hope in my experience working with consumers and family members um, and providers and policymakers across the state of California for many, many years. Hope creates motivation and that leads to the willingness to take on change and challenges and things that you've always wanted to do that you never thought you could and things that, um, that you've always wanted to, ways you've always wanted to express yourself. So Bill Anthony did that for this country. <laughs> He wrote an article about 25 years ago that was about, if, about this. If you really believe that people with mental health issues can reconnect with their strengths and, and, and get back into their lives, based on the research of Courtney Harding and others, then we have to redesign our mental health systems. And that started a whole avalanche of community activation across the country where stakeholders who agreed with him made space to start initiatives to start that conversation about recreating the mental health system to transform it. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, really, we're talking about Bill Anthony's impact on California in, in a way. Bill Anthony and, and many federal um, initiatives that were inspired by his work. So mental health, we're going to talk about the Mental Health Services Act, which is a statewide initiative in California that has many components designed to activate a broad range of community mental health stakeholders 
in service of systems transformation. And those stakeholders include local businesses, policymakers, landlords, employers, colleges, um, providers, family members, and most importantly, clients who have the lived experience that is understood to inform the transformation. So California Mental Health Services Act, its, its, um, its goal was to transform the mental health system from one that focuses primarily on clinical services into one, in, into one which enables people to attain their goals. And the main way they wanted to do that was to create space for these mental health programs to enter into partnerships with clients and their families and their communities to try and figure mm -hmm. out, to try and identify what, what, the, what the consumers wanted and to redesign the system in order to make that happen. Um, the mm -hmm. Mental Health Services Act funded had many, many different components. I'm going to talk about one of the components, which was called systems transformation. There are 58 counties in California, and one of the five funding streams was systems transformation. I was the community planner to work with um, a broad range of people in Alameda County. It was over 2,000 people in six planning groups um, over the course of a year to, to try and figure out how to take our initial $15 million allotment and and fund services and supports that would address health inequities and increase the, the integration of wellness supports into the culture and operations of our system. The program that I worked with, that I managed to do this was called the Wellness Recovery Resiliency Hub. And our, our purpose was to engage the strengths of consumers, family members, and providers so that people in recovery could li 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 live meaningful lives guided by their own choices in their communities. We were striving for community interdependence to help people bridge going from the mental health system back into their lives. So we worked with stakeholders inside the mental health community and outside the mental health community in, in the, um, it, within, within, the, within local communities. Our structure, again, we're, what I'm doing, I'm describing the program that was the change agent for community activation within our mental health system in our community. Um, so the structure and values, we were an internal consultancy. The people that worked in our staff all had lived experience as clients within mostly the, the, the public, public mental health system. I have experience within the private mental health system. We were in a large county, and again, our goal was to integrate culturally resonant wellness practices into the culture and operations of programs across the entire system of care and into the community. Um, our product, the way we did this is we co-created experiences with all of these stakeholders to help them identify changes that could be made in their leadership role within the system or within the community, wherever they were perched. So we did that by working with them to offer workshops, classes, and events that would build knowledge and skills in, and this is the, the first piece is the most conservative, but also really important, to, to try and help everyone, providers and clients, be, experience wellness-oriented self-care and practice. Secondly, we worked with leadership across, across from, from, from clients through boards of directors, inside and outside the, the mental health system, to provide organizational development and leadership training, um, including training that was, that was directed towards trauma-informed environments, across the continuum of services and into the community. And finally, we worked on delivery system redesign, thanks to Bill Anthony. <laughs> and his idea that the idea is to, is to exit the mental health system and go back to work and go back to school and go back to your life. Okay, so outcomes. The outcomes of this, um, our, our particular role in the initiative was to create stakeholder and system willingness to engage in hope and change to cultivate knowledge, skills, and experiences required for, to leave the client role and for, for clients to leave the client role and for providers to leave, to allow that to happen so that, so that people in the system could return to interdependence with the community. So we worked with consumer organizations and here's examples of outcomes with our consumer organizations. We held workshops and retreats to build leadership and organizational skills required to collaborate with the county and other stakeholders so that the voice of the client was 
was was easily heard, and our our basic idea was that nobody, providers, policymakers, clients, housewives, no one is born with the skills to be able to enter into a public space and know how to influence. Very few of us know how to do that. So actually, everyone need, could use a little bit of support and coaching, and we provided that support and coaching to everyone, including the client organizations. Um, we helped um, a major client organization complete a strategic plan. That, that placed wrap services and other wellness supports across the continuum of services from the inpatient hospital settings through outpatient, basic outpatient services, uh, mobile crisis, uh, housing, um, community education, wellness centers. And then we have had a year long cycle of mentoring workshops for consumer providers. We kind of did the same thing for providers and family organizations. It just we took on the, the issues in the organization. So for providers, we helped build staff capacity to support self-efficacy and wellness, wellness for clients and family members, but also for staff. So the idea, again, is that in order to be able to, to be a successful um, activist, <clears throat> community activist, I'd say, or engagement, engager, one needs to have hope and a good sense of strength in order to be motivated to, 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 to be able to take on the challenges and make those changes. So we, were, we emphasized that. <clears throat> we also, with that in mind, we helped to build leadership capacity required to redesign services within the, the system and also to help the providers take a more effective role re in, in influencing um, the county and the community with a, in their voice to direct what what a better community mental health system should look like. So we help them in their roles as advocates and influencers. And the same thing with family organizations. <clears throat> we worked with family organizations to build staff and volunteer competencies in wellness recovery and resiliency. We also helped establish a, a organization whose purpose was to support family uh, families in being advocates both for their loved ones and also within the, the, the mental health system to try and help the mental health system understand and respect the role of family members. So I think you can see <clears throat> what we were doing. There we go. And there we go. Lessons learned <clears throat> to honor and validate strengths, to, to make, a, make a really big tent to include all stakeholders in change processes, and to um, take the long view. Change, take, change takes time. And um, it's important to um, accept that and be strategic in looking for opportunities to make those changes. And then the importance of self-care for everyone. Okay, so going back to, to Sue's point about the different levels of, 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 of activation, I'm going to reframe it a little bit. <clears throat> Level one is about building self-efficacy. And so this is how we did it. Our basic philosophy was this. Again, our program team members included people that had every diagnosis, <laughs> had been through in the entire mental health system, had been homeless, and had been in the jail, and were addicted to substances, and were in a point of their life where they had reconnected with their strengths, reconnected with their skills, and they wanted to give back. And so those were the people on the team. <clears throat> so lived experience as family members and clients Nothing about us without us, as Chaku reminded us. And the best way to keep your recovery is to give it away. Um, and so our team did that with all of the stakeholders, clients, providers, family members, businessmen, colleges, national organizations. We went national with this program as well. And the other importance of self-efficacy is to be an ally to the change process. The idea is to create space. So that other, so the people that you're that you're supporting can find their own motivation because that's what's going to drive the change. Activation is is not directed by someone from the top. It's it's directed by people um, aligning with each other in in a in a in a common cause. And then we co-created all program events with stakeholders. So the idea is that we weren't we didn't hold the expertise. We ex we we came to, to our, the stakeholders saying, you have expertise. We have some resources for you because we have the time to think about things a little more broadly because we're not delivering direct services 
or running a program. So the idea is that we co-created all the program events with stakeholders. We offered opportunities for people to build mastery with the values and practices of wellness so that when we left the scene, they could, they could t carry on on their own. And that was the whole idea. And the idea too is that community activation is run on the same principles as one, one works, as when one works within individuals and in wellness and recovery. It's the same principle. You want to support people to have the hope and motivation and willingness to reconnect with their strengths and to make those decisions to learn how to move their ideas and their, their will into the world. And that's hard for everyone to do. And it's also a wonderful thing. And when it works, it's quite, quite wonder, wonderful. And mastery is an important part of that. So one of the main, main ways we did it is we provided experiences for people where they could take the skills and the knowledge we were offering and put it into practice. So those experiences were workshops, conference and event planning, <clears throat> and doing the conferences or events strategic planning, re leadership retreats, and self-care. The second <clears throat> level, first was self-efficacy. The second level of community activation is providing, like I just said, experiences where people can take <clears throat> their, 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 what they want to do and what they've learned and put it into action so they can, they can, they can build the skills. And so an example for clients is that we completed monthly leadership workshops with the Pool of Consumer Champions, which is a group of 450 people that are currently receiving services, who were brought together <clears throat> to plan and participate in public meetings that would support their shift from client to an empowered member of the community. And we helped the pool figure out how to do that. With providers, we walked the talk by completing with, we had, <clears throat> Uh, assertive community teams, and we provided two six-month rounds of appreciative inquiry with all of these teams to help the teams understand <clears throat> um, how to shift problem solving from deficits with their clients to what works. And that also included helping them understand and remember what their, their strengths were as providers. And these teams um, worked with <clears throat> 30,000 outpatient adults. And so this was a big system, a system um, change move to do appreciative inquiry, which basically looks at what works, what can be improved, and what can we do different as a way to solve problems. And I just want to say that we worked with the Yale program on community um, and recovery and community health on this. We brought them in. They also were, we also worked with the hospitals on this one. We also worked, okay, and then level three is an example. And level three is um, helping build skills. And so our example here is housing services. We worked with our, our housing. We know how important housing is for mental health. You can't have mental health if you don't have some kind of housing, whether it's on the street or it's in a, a, a shelter that you feel comfortable and safe in. So with housing services, we helped change the culture by co-creating with them curricula on wellness recovery topics for operators of community living facilities. Something that they wanted to learn about but had no idea how to do, and they were very grateful for this. And we co-created a housing resource book for consumers and helped them develop a 211 hotline um, for housing. So level four. <clears throat> is support. So again, we started with self-efficacy, then we went to experience, and then we went to skills. The fourth level is support. And support is validation of strengths. And one way we do this <clears throat> on a community level is to have a community-sanctioned initiative that helps um, validate the change from the top down. So what we've talked about before is giving people the skills to create the change from the bottom up. And all of us, many of us know that you need both in order to make things work. But you definitely need the leaders to say it's okay to do this. So they, we, we figured out that the easiest way to, um, to, to, to motivate change was to address trauma because 90% of the people in the community mental health system have <clears throat> experienced complex trauma which produces mental health symptoms on top of whatever their emotional geography has in it that might, might include the, the, 
the, a mental health, a mental health, um, a mental health issue. So we did a, cons a trauma informed care initiative. It was a multi year initiative. It was four years to validate and build <clears throat> on the on the practices of providers and client groups in the system where they dealt positively with culturally tra resonant trauma informed care. Again, like with individuals, we looked for things that worked. We did an assessment first. We also co-created a task force led by consumer leaders that included all members of the community inside and outside the mental health system to, to define this and to lead it. Our initiative, <clears throat> we completed an inventory of all the strength-based wellness-oriented trauma-informed practices across the continuum of care and into the community where clients are found. And then we did a conference. We brought in, we brought in SAMHSA and other experts and our own experts to celebrate and acknowledge what's working. And this, um, this initiative ended up with a plan that took the trauma-informed care principles and practices and moved them forward in a way that would, um, that would go ble bleed into places where, where our, our clients went for services and supports in the community and in other agencies. So future plans. The Wellness Recovery Initiative <clears throat> was um, active for about eight years. And at the end of it, they thought, we thought it would be best to decentralize those functions into regular county agencies. So this was like a, an, an add-on for the Mental Health Services Act. So what we did is we, 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 we put the, the ability to, to co-create these workshops and these experiences and these retreats into the pool of consumer champions, led by Katera Aslami, who's there as a consumer rep on the executive board of Alameda County Behavioral Healthcare Services, into the housing department, into our contracts department. So all of our contracts with providers in this county have wellness recovery incentives in them. So we basically um, put all those incentives into the system um, to make sure that, uh, um, that it would, uh, that, 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 that would have a life of its own. And, and thank you, that was fun. <laughs> I'm gonna um, pass this back to Wendy, who's not on my list. So, Chaku? So Wendy's not, not on my list of panelists. Hi Margaret, no worries. We're getting the ball over to Wendy right now. Okay, all right, cool. So good afternoon, while they're passing the ball over, I will start my introduction. This has truly been an exercise in resilience, so it is perfect that I'm ending this webinar to talk about community resilience. Sounds like, Margaret, you've had some challenges with your voice during this, so um, resilience and we all strive on. So um, my name is Wendy Ellis, I'm the project director of the Building Community Resilience Collaborative Networks that's based here at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. We're a national collaborative that seeks to improve the health and life outcomes of children, families, and communities. So we have teams from all over the country that work on this work um, with us that is around the pair of ACEs. And so this is really implementing this process, this BCR process that I'll go into in a, a couple minutes here, that help our communities not only bounce back in the face of adversity, but bounce forward. And I do want to pause here and talk about, you know, that is our view of resilience. And so I know that um, the common uh, definition of resilience, which comes from physics, is, um, you know, an, abil an object's ability to retain shape after suffering a shock. But we don't want to apply a term from physics to the human spirit. And so in building community resilience, we recognize that there will be adversities that um, occur in life that can have these negative outcomes that we use this framework around adverse childhood experiences. But we also know that these things are happening in the context of an adverse community environment. Hence, the, our concept of resilience is that if we strengthen these adverse community environments, not only do we help to provide uh, supports and buffers in the, uh, uh, in the uh, instance of an adverse childhood experience, but we also then provide supports and buffers that are preventing and uh, mitigating some of these things. So that's really what our work is around, is thinking about this both from an 
intervention perspective, but also from a prevention perspective. So we have five communities across the country that are involved in this work. Our teams are using the BCR process and tools that include a coalition um, and build, coalition and building and communications guide, as well as a partner um, build and grow action guide to help them identify their community strengths, to work in partnership with community, not upon community, and develop to, to develop a shared understanding of adversities and goals. Let's see here. So the BCR process is um, really working around, now we heard earlier Margaret mentioned mental health systems transformation. Well, we're going one step further in saying that it's not enough to just think about how our healthcare delivery and our public health delivery systems um, are set up, but we have to think about this in the context of all of our other systems. And so using the BCR process, our teams are working to align these large systems with one another such as healthcare, city government, education, juvenile justice, criminal justice, police um, departments, those are just some of the partners that we have on board. And also with community-based partners, including parenting support services and grassroots health advocacy. These teams develop strategies from implementing trauma-informed practice to data sharing and advocating for policy change. And I think that this is really important um, when we talk about the policy aspect of this because we are really focused on the long-term sustainability of this. So while it is very important, all of the, the speakers today have talked about both individual behavioral change, practice change and program change, we believe that in order to have long-term sustainable change, we have to have those um, lessons learned and the data piece of this to share to influence the long-term um, policy change. So this will bolster the strengths, fill gaps, and ultimately build child, family, and community resilience. So how do we go about doing this? You heard me talk about um, the fact that we collect data um, through all of our work. So all of our work is really aimed at helping our team to convene together across the systems with community um, at the table to create this shared understanding of what we call the pair of aces. So those adverse childhood experiences, the adverse community environments, which are commonly referred to in a public health and a healthcare setting as the social determinants of health. And one of the things that we found that's really important is our language and how we communicate um, the problem that we're trying to solve. And so we've tried to come up with language that is agnostic agnostic, meaning that um, we don't always use the health-related terms um, because, you know, going to a public safety department or going to a judge, they may not necessarily see themselves in the healthcare business, although most of us recognize their role in building health. So um, really being very clear in our language and also how we communicate with community. So again, it's the, it's the combination of activation as well as engagement. Um, in order to, to inform solutions, identify what are those priorities, and co-create the solutions moving forward. So we have across our dashboard, we really try to collect that data that helps us indicate how are we progressing in those areas around asset mapping, using programs and tools, using data to inform our decisions, um, as to how, we, how well we communicate across sectors, as well as um, the policy and advocacy conversation. So that's part of the, um, the milestone map. And then we really think about the outputs. What happens when you get not only community um, engaged and activated, but really working side by side with these systems? So we bring together these backbone organizations and their per their, these partners with shared purpose to help us understand um, how well is the system prepared for systems change and where can we begin? What are those strengths that we can build upon in order to move forward as far as program and systems change in the reduction of both of those ACEs, the adverse community environments, as well as those adverse um, childhood experiences. So we do this through a system of, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the asset mapping with partners at the table, but we also do town halls where we actually interact with community um, and systems together to discuss these thorny issues. Um, and then we think about putting in place this um, infrastructure that's on the, um, on the ground there that helps that work remain in place long after the BCR, the national team, has gone back to D.C. 
So some of those outcomes, what will it look like when we're successful? We're beginning to see some of those outcomes actually now, three years into this work, beginning to come to play. And that's really, you know, the first piece of this is that integration and alignment of various systems. And I'll give you an example of that from our partner on the ground in Oregon. <clears throat> My voice is having a little resilience problem here. I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. So one of the other areas is around equity. So one of the things that we talk about in BCR is the fact that in order to be a resilient community, one must be equitable. As you remember from looking at that parabasis tree, <clears throat> a lot of the issues with regard to the adverse community environments are really rooted in the inequities in our systems and in our communities. Understanding that if there's an inequitable distribution of resources, if there's an inequitable distribution of opportunity, say of even opportunity um, for access to economic mobility, but that is going to drive a lot of these things that we commonly refer to as the social determinants. And so really working at it from a systems point of view, we are getting to beginning to see some of that change with regard to how cities are discussing the equitable distribution and also understanding how equity undermines the overall vitality of their cities. And so we have two cities in particular that are, are taking this on, well actually three cities in particular in our group that are taking equity on head first, and that's in Portland, Oregon, where the Multnomah County Public Health Department has stated in its mission, uh, mission statement to undo the effects of white supremacy. In Dallas, Texas, they are also looking at putting equity at the center of their resilience strategy and adopting the term that an equitable, equitable Dallas is a resilient Dallas. As well as here in Washington, D.C., the city of D.C. is also uh, currently developing its long-term resil resilience strategy and understanding that equity is at the center of that. And so where we're seeing this being driven from a systems perspective, um, particularly at the city government level, this filters down to multiple systems and particularly those systems that are serving children and families and have great influence in the behavioral health outcomes of all. So these are some of the outcomes and how we begin to track how we're um, having this long-term impact on our communities. With the long-term exposure to ACEs should be reduced as well as increasing the viability of our community environments, reducing the adversities that are um, part of the structural factors, um, such as reducing uh, the, the effects that are associated with poverty, violence, and racism, and then also expo exposing, I mean, um, creating an opportunity where exposure to ACEs are reduced and prevented. So this is what's happening um, across, the, across the network, but I wanna do a deep dive into one of our particular sites that has been at the forefront of a lot of this work, and that's our BCR, BCR Oregon team. Now BCR Oregon began in Portland, and during this year, three years into the work, has now spread to a statewide network where, their pro where the BCR process serves as a fundamental strategy and organizing platform to improve child health and wellness outcomes in Portland and throughout the state. The Trillium uh, Group is, a, is the backbone organization for the Oregon team, and they are um, Oregon's largest provider of mental and behavioral health care for children and families, and the state's only provider offering a full continuum of children's mental and behavioral health services. And um, I have a few of the stats here on the, on the state of child welfare in Oregon to help you understand the state of the issue there. Um, not, in addition to having one of the highest rates of childhood poverty, also one of the lowest graduation rates in the country, um, the child welfare in the state of Oregon is under particular strong um, scrutiny right now uh, for an issue with regard to hoteling. They've had an issue where um, they've run out of capacity for child welfare facilities, and they've been hoteling children um, in, in, um, in facilities because they don't have enough of the uh, families and community to take care of children. And so this has really prompted the state to begin to think about how can we leverage our community partners in a much more collaborative fashion. And of course, this is where BCR comes in and working with a number of their different partners across the state. 
So our BC Oregon team includes 3 to PhD, which is a consortium of school-focused organizations in Oregon that includes Trillium, Concordia University, the Fabian School, which is a public, uh, Portland public school, which is from pre-K to eighth grade, and recently expanded to include healthcare provider Kaiser Permanente. The team's newest partner, Oregon Public Health Institute, is helping to ensure the work is centered in undoing systemic oppression, promoting health equity, and furthering the reach into promoting into, into communities not currently at the table. So with this work, they are really focused on community solutions, community first, and where systems come in to address systemic gaps. And what I want to focus on first is the 3 to PhD program, which is really a great example of how you work with community to identify what are the, um, what are the needs and then have those, those solutions inform with community participation. So this work began at the Fabian School about seven years ago. And um, after, the, after they had identified that schools really could be the future wellness hubs of their community. So Trillium trauma-informed and sanctuary work led them to join the 3 to PhD consortium, which includes Concordia University and the Fabian School. So to give you an idea of just what was um, facing those individuals at the, at the, the school student population at Fabian School, 90% of the students at the school live in public housing or trailer parks and 20% of the population is homeless. So you can imagine the associated behavioral health needs as well as healthcare needs and social service needs that are going to be associated with um, not only these children, these students, but also their families. And so what they did is begin what the principals, principal and the student, um, student family population did was begin to um, explore opportunities to partner with other organizations in the Portland community to begin to identify how we could address these needs of this, uh, in data, of this vulnerable school population. And so um, it was an activist principal who walked, as uh, she puts it, 122 steps from the school to next door to Concordia University to the university president and said, could you help us? And he was shocked because no one had ever come to him to ask for help, and he didn't think that they actually could do anything to help a public school being a Lutheran university. So they um, worked together, crossing that school, that state and church barrier, and have come up with this partnership that now seven years later has created this tra complete trauma-informed transformation for the school with a co-location of Kaiser Permanente well se Wellness Center in the school that serves not only the behavioral health care needs, but health care and oral health care needs of the students. Also, because most of these students live in an area that is known as either a food desert or a food swamp, um, so access to healthy foods, healthy nutritious foods are, um, are a challenge. They uh, worked with a local um, provider that has set up a food pantry in the store where you can use your SNAP benefits, you can use cash, you can use credit cards. They've normalized behaviors around using the school, using the school store, so actually staff um, access the store, and everyone has access to these organic um, nutritious foods that are low cost. So um, in addition to that, because Trillium has um, instituted the sanctuary framework in all of their facilities, as well as being trauma-informed, they went through a trauma-informed transformation of the, of the entire school faculty, um, as well as teachers and all support staff. So you, they created a trauma-informed environment for not only the students, but also for their families. And in the last three years, what you've seen is that absenteeism as well as suspension rates have reduced, reading levels have increased, and parent engagement and teacher retention has also increased. So, of course, you can imagine with all of that that this has also reduced the number of um, behavioral health problems um, and mental health issues for these children as well. 
So in addition to working at the very at the very micro community level and serving, you know, a specific population, one of the other ish areas in which the Oregon team has really been um, at the forefront around reducing st stigma for around mental health. Um, as well as confronting racism and the effects on mental health of racism and other isms is the programmatic work that they've done on a statewide public advocacy campaign called Keep Oregon Well. This is um, a, really around reducing stigma and opening a conversation around mental and behavioral health as well as equity and inclusion. This work is an extension of their commitment to build a trauma-informed community by resetting media and societal norms to foster more open engagement around the factors associated with the pair of ACEs. Um, so this Keep Oregon Well in Schools program, which is an extension of the lessons learned from Fabian School program, kicked off with their expansion into Gladstone and Centennial School District, which is just adjacent to the Portland School District last year. And they're looking at further expansion across the state in this year. So in addition to having these, um, these media-based uh, campaigns and these mental health heroes, success programs, and a statewide volunteer program that really has activated both those individuals with lived experience, and we will we say they're allies um, across the state. They've also opened wellness zones locations all, all across Portland that serve as program spaces for advocates and volunteers. Um, so again, giving putting in community um, the, those resources and that safe space to um, celebrate what we call neural diversity. So those opportunities for success have really come from across a number of different channels. Again, they leverage the BCR platform, the process, the tools and resources that we provide around support for um, community town halls and opportunities for engagement, but they've also been really smart in how they use media campaigns. And again, if you want to learn more about their media campaigns, you can certainly I'll give you our, email, our uh, website address, but you can also Google Keep Oregon Well, and I think that a lot of the, the strategies that they use to normalize the conversation around mental health and well-being, and again, those tactics that they've used to engage individuals with lived experience as well as um, uh, concerns uh, community members has really helped not only in increasing collaboration on mental health uh, issues in, across the state, but it's also helped to really cement um, strong partnerships for these um, important initiatives that I discussed here. So again, all of the tools and resources for BCR, they're free and widely available. Um, we put these things out because we feel like, you know, it's great that all of the teams that are uh, doing this work in BCR across the country are able to provide these lessons learned, but we're starting a re resilience revolution, so we're flipping the coin on mental health and creating more um, prosperous environments by working across sectors, and we want to help others to do the same. And so um, a part of this, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's the three Ps. It's not just practice and program, but it's policy as well. And so our latest tool that we put out was the policy and advocacy guide so that you can learn how to take this language around resilience, around the pair of ACEs, and begin to have influence in your own community with regard to building resilience. So with that, I'm going to close and hand this back over to Crystal and really look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Um, what an impressive panel that we have here, and I can't believe all the information you all got into this webinar in just under 90 minutes. So thank you to everyone. Um, in the interest of time, we're supposed to wrap up in about 10 minutes. So with that in mind, um, first I'd like to give it to Sue and Shaku and ask if you have any uh, reactions or anything that you want to bring all together from what everyone just heard about uh, Margaret and Wendy's programs. So as I was listening to both a Wendy and Margaret, I was so impressed. You could see so clearly each of the kind of uh, phases of activation in what they were doing and bringing that into such sophisticated settings. So um, just so impressed with what you're doing and thank you for making it so clear how you apply um, theory into really global change. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say that Personally, it's just it's so exciting to see just how right on time this is right now. Everything that's happening is 
and Wendy and Margaret the work that you've done already and what we're preparing to do. I'm, I'm ready to sign up already, Wendy, by the way. We need to make sure this happens in Rochester as well, and we're, I think, primed for, for some great work together in that regard. And, and, you know, we'd love to see these kinds of efforts, especially, you know, when just in the context of care of ACES. So I have a ton of questions uh, for both of you, and maybe we can move to those soon. Thanks. Great, thanks so much. Um, why don't we, Chaku, if you have some questions of your own that you'd like to field, do you want to go ahead and get that started? Oh, sure, thank you. So, yeah, you're welcome. I'll, you know, go start with Wendy then. So, Wendy, when we, you know, you mentioned a few important engagement strategies there, and I love the focus on really non system language or in the concept of, you know, system agnostic kind of language in that respect. Were there other aspects of bringing uh, community more into conversations or partners more into you know into these you know, res into the pair of aces conversations that you'd advise because first you know we, we want to be able to have that conversation more more deeply so how would how would you say we should start yeah I'm, I'm I'm glad that you asked that question because an aspect of this work you know the teams have been working um, together now since uh, early 2015. And we're just now at the point where we're doing some programmatic implementation of some really innovative programs, and that has gone at the speed of trust. And so those relationships, both with community um, as well as across multiple partners, really are going to move at the speed of trust. And so um, one of the things that I will say that, um, you know, I did a really good job in talking to our funders when we first started this program is that you're not going to see change in, you know, 12 months. If that's the funding cycle that you're interested in, this may not be <laughs> the right project to invest in because we are talking about overcoming uh, systemic as well as historic um, trauma, um, historic trauma from this from the community standpoint, and then systemic in the sense of, you know, the way that our systems are funded are built up around mistrust of each other. We don't share data, we don't share secrets, uh, and we're um, unfortunately designed to almost be in competition with one another. So it does require a process of building these bridges um, and creating the safe space. So that's really where our team came in for the first year is building that safe space, um, setting the table so that we could begin to um, break down some of those barriers around trust in order to be able to begin to build a collaboration across sectors. Um, that's the first piece of it. And then um, the other part of this is to get to the nitty gritty is that this isn't kumbaya. I mean, we all want to feel good <laughs> about what we do. But the reality is, is that at the end of the day, um, we're going to be measured by um, our performance measures. And so, again, I think part of the, um, you know, the impetus around and the importance on not focusing on any one sector's language is because we have to be respectful of um, what each individual or what each organization really at the end of the day is funded to do. And so um, really coming, once you've got that trust built, you can begin to look at each other's measures and figure out, well, what would, be, what would success look like, not just for the community, but for each partner that's involved. And so creating these goals, objectives, and designing programs so that there is a win collectively, um, and then helping the partners to see that um, you can get to that win in a much more productive and long-term sustainable way if we're actually working together. Uh, one of the examples that, uh, that has really helped in the Portland area was understanding um, that connection between education, health, and juvenile justice. And so helping those sectors understand that, you know, from an education standpoint, if you really want to focus on uh, third grade reading levels or if it's, you know, success in high school, whether that be graduation or timely matriculation, then our children have to be healthy and ready to learn. 
And, and if our children aren't healthy and ready to learn, some of these other um, outcomes could be involvement with juvenile justice. And so there's an interest from the juvenile justice perspective and public safety perspective to reduce those, those numbers and also reduce for those that are already in justice involved to reduce recidivism. And so how do we create a healthier school environment that keeps them engaged? Well, it is thinking about those trauma-informed practices within the school environment, but it's also making sure, well, are our kids, you know, are they receiving the, the healthy nutrition that they need? Can they sit still in the classroom um, in order to focus? And so we have fewer uh, behavioral health issues. And if there are behavioral health issues in the classroom, are we dealing with them as a conduct issue versus a criminal issue? And so that gets to that school to prison pipeline. So it's really having those more in-depth conversations across systems to them, for them to understand how one action in one system has an impact in another system and how really collectively um, it doesn't necessarily serve any one system to work in an isolation. Wonderful, thank you. Crystal, do you have any more that you wanted to bring in? Yeah, sure, we only have um, about five minutes left to the webinar, so I'm going to give a question um, over to Margaret and ask that you keep your response just to one or two minutes. And that is going back to what you talked about happening in Alameda County, what advice can you give to the audience for creating buy-in with leadership that the broader community matters and that this isn't always about, about the individual services and individual treatment, but getting the community involved and engaging in this activation? That's, that's the core question. <laughs> So I think that the best thing to do is to sit down with the, the, with your, the people that want to have the conversation with the leaders and map out the opportunities for alignment. Figure out what you want and figure out what matters to those leaders and bring people into the conversation with the leaders who, that, who they respect who also share your values. Um, with Mental Health Services Act, we had the advantage of the state and a whole bunch of community stakeholders saying that mental health transformation, wellness and recovery is important. And the creation of the legislation created a, a, a change in norms. It was now okay to think about that. And lots of people had the experience of working in that broader campaign. So the idea is, is, to, is, to, uh, is to make sure that the people in the conversation are aligned with the leader and or think of it as a multi-year process and create smaller projects um, over the course of time that link stakeholders together who share your view and build it up to the point where the leader is, um, is, is on board with or, 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 sympath or, or empathetic to the issues you want to bring in. It's a process of co-creating trust. Wonderful, thanks so much, Margaret. And um, Sue, do you want to add anything to that same question about um, creating buy-in with leadership to engage the larger community in the activation process rather than focusing maybe solely on individual level patient activation in just about a minute? Sorry to rush you. <laughs> So no, I actually think um, she got it completely on the head. You know, figure out where you align with leaders. Um, uh, um, talk about what you have in common. Figure out what matters to that leader and al align with where they're seeing the world go and add your flavor to that so that you can achieve that outcome that you're looking for. Um, so I think, I think her response is perfect and I just echo that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are out of time. Once again, we would really like to thank all the speakers on today's webinar, um, Sue Burgesson, Shaku Matai, Wendy Ellis, and Margaret Walkover for taking the time to engage in this panel on making the shift from patient activation to community activation. So if you had any questions that were not answered on today's webinar, you can feel free to contact any of the speakers directly. Their email addresses are on the screen, or you can contact SAMHSA's Program to Achieve Wellness at paw at prainc com. That's paw at com. So thank you again to our panel uh, participants, and thank you for all of our attendees for joining us today. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.